call the meeting to order and uh, let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Uh, uh, all uh, directors are uh, present. Uh, welcome back, Mr. Rossi. And um, that brings us to uh, uh, executive session announcements. There will be an executive session for labor negotiations with the non-professional uh, staff immediately following the board meeting. And uh, that moves us to public comment. Do we have anybody here who would like to make uh, public comment? I have no forms, but raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Or forever hold your peace. Okay, uh, let's move to the report of the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Rabinowitz. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to bring to your attention today, but I, I do want to make a comment. Um, we, we spent the lion's share of today and yesterday um, engaging in district learning walks. Um, this was our first launch of, of, the, of this um, concept that I've been trying to get going for the last couple of years. And thanks to Mr. Voorhees, um, he helped me bring this to fruition. And I have to tell you, it was a fantastic experience. Um, we put together um, he put together with his team a, a, a survey instrument, so to speak, that we use for the walkthroughs. But it was focused pr specifically on what the building principals wanted us to look for. And the building principals met with their staff, and they came up with what we should look for. So at Lower on Monday, we were looking at some of their questioning techniques, and we were in different classrooms and um, recording some of the questions that the teachers asked and also that the students asked the teacher and, and the level of thinking that went in in the Bloom's taxonomy that was used in, in determining those questions. And then we looked for themes of what we saw because, again, this wasn't to um, pinpoint a particular teacher, but rather to look for themes across the building of things that they were looking at implementing. And then, we, and then we brought the themes out, drew the themes out, and then Daniel put together a report that we just, he just submitted back to the building, and then it's the intent of the building principal to take that back to her staff and have conversation with them about what they were, um, you know, what, what their strengths are and what some areas for growth are in terms of the building in general and that particular focal area. Today we did the same thing at Ringing Rocks, and it was a, you know, very refreshing day, and I had an opportunity to make um, text-to-self connections with a group of um, first graders when I, they were reading about a moose and I actually had a picture of the moose that we had found when we were in Wyoming and so it was really great to be able to engage the students and for them to say, oh, you made a text to self-connection, Miss Viola. And so the, just so there's some things that are happening I think that are, we should be really proud of and I asked the two teachers that were involved today at Ringing Rocks what they thought of this and I have to tell you they couldn't, they couldn't say enough positive things about what they learned um, in engaging in this and being able to say, oh my gosh, that teacher really did X well, or the way she set up her, you know, her word walls. Oh, this teacher, you know, I really like the way the students understood the transitions. They were seamless. So just for them to be able to see each other and what's gone on and be able to report out on areas of strength and then also areas really, I wouldn't say weaknesses, but areas of inconsistency perhaps and where we can use strengths of one teacher to help with not a strength of another and vice versa. Um, it, it just was very nice. And we have three other um, district learning walks scheduled for the upcoming weeks in the other buildings, so I can keep you posted on that information. And I'm sure Daniel's probably going to share out the um, strengths and weaknesses, or we'd be happy to, of the buildings and what they're working toward. So that, that's what we were doing the last two days. And my first discussion item was uh, about the calendar. And you have a copy of a calendar in your packet that I sent home with you on Friday, and we were still working through this, and I told you I wanted to vet this through the um, administrative cabinet to see if we had caught everything. Um, and also, I always work with the teachers' union when I'm putting together a calendar. And they really like the calendar that we have here, and the recommendation, obviously, is to start after Labor Day. Um, particularly because of the high school renovation project that allows us another full week to ensure that we're ready for opening. It's similar in nature to the calendar that was on the docket this year that ultimately was approved. Um, 
we, we have some built-in snow days, as you can see, similar to what we did this year that worked out very well for us. The one suggestion that was made by both an administrative uh, principal who, who works in a K-2 building and also by our union was that we might want to consider on this current calendar that you have in front of you, and I'll pass the, op the option out, I call it option B, but it's essentially to put a half day on December the 23rd um, so that students would dismiss it at the half, as would teachers. 12-month employees would obviously work the full day. But then instead, at the very end in June, only have two half days for students. So you'll see the difference when, when I pass it out to you. So essentially, historically, in the Potts Grove School District, we've always had three half days at the very end one of which contractually the teachers get to leave as at a half day too because they came in and did a half day in August. In this scenario, um, we're suggesting putting the half day on the 23rd because we know families you know, that are traveling at the holidays and you know how all the holiday hoopla is going on anyway on that very last day with the sing-alongs at the K2 buildings and so on. So they could actually have a half day on the 23rd would be enable those families to get going but then in June we'd have a full day on the 12th of June and then a half the 13th and a half the 14th um, and then that would still give us two more days in that week for snow days like we had this year and then some of them would then go back into the calendar so that's really the main difference and then the other difference that that we we wanted to do is not have the um, we wanted to move one of our staff development days from the beginning to and intersperse it back into the calendar where it had been in the past because we felt like having um, more than two and a half days at the beginning was too much for teachers to really get the full benefit out of that for them. So we wanted to intersperse that back into the calendar, which we did. We put it in October. You'll see it in October. Um, so our, our recommendation would be option B, which is the one that I passed out second. Um, but also option A is um, suitable and all of the parties that were involved in so far in review thought they were good options and obviously for you know we can listen to the board's recommendations and post whatever you'd like for public review and you can vote on it next meeting or whenever you'd like but wanted to get something in your hands does anybody have any uh, questions or comments about Option A or uh, Option B. Um, I have some, but I figured I'd wait till uh, you see if you folks uh, say it first. I just want to ask one question. I know you discussed this, I believe, last year. Is there a reason why we always have to have the first options for the snow days at the end of the seat year? Um, well, because typically what happens when there when there's too many that are built in is. We have staff members and we have families that make commitments to do things and then we don't have adequate coverage and we have a um, high rate of absenteeism during those days because families have made um, plans to do certain things and that's why, uh, and, and if you look in others, I should have mentioned this too, but I, I, I did a lot of looking at other school districts calendars and typically they build days at the end and then some then are always uh, also built in. I think I did. Um, yes, sir. The other thing I did change on this calendar for next year, I forgot to mention, is at the very bottom, you see the verbiage I wrote, make up days beginning on the second day in which classes are canceled. Meaning we have 181 days, student days built into our calendar, but the law, the, the code only requires 180. And I saw this language in another um, district's calendar. So in other words, they built in some days into their calendar but then if they um, need them, then that, those are the days they use first. So in other words, our first snow day could really be the 181st day. So we could still end on the, um, the 13th or the 14th as it stands here and, and have a snow day. You see what I'm saying? And, and so I put that verbiage in because typically I would come back to the board and then I'd say, would you like to pardon that day? And then we'd have to make a motion. And this way it's right up front for the parent. They know up oh, the first snow day is, is a given because that's built into the calendar. The other way school districts build it into the calendar is I could, I could build it in so we don't end till the 16th. But see, then the days are in the calendar. But we've chosen just to say up front, we're trying to get out on the 14th, but you need to hold these two days. 
and um, that typically works better for us in terms of getting um, making sure we have enough our staff and our students that aren't uh, a high rate of absenteeism so. just a question uh, we're off uh, proposed to be off the 21st of October and the 1st of November um, it, is it would it be more would it there be benefits to having a, a, the Friday and a, the immediate following Monday for those that want to go away for a few days, or is there is there other reasons to keep it separated like this? Well, we we've thought about that also, and sometimes what happens is then we have teachers that aren't there, and if the purpose is for professional development, then you want your staff to be there as well as well, and also um, when there's large blocks of time. Sometimes the students get a little antsy, so we try to keep them on track. Um, so th those would be the two reasons. I mean, there's certainly no reason we couldn't do it, but I think those would be the two reasons that we've discussed before as problematic or maybe why you wouldn't want to. Just to go with Bill's, and I don't know if this is a re could you have, again, I don't know, because uh, the, they're both staff days, could, would it be beneficial to the staff to have two in a row? Like, in other words, October 31st and the 1st? Because they're staff days, right? The 21st and the 1st? They're staff days. Well, yeah. Is that well, a bad student, idea? I mean, having two um, days in a row to work on something I, rather I than a day a and then idea. wait and then another day? And I hear what you're saying. I don't know if it's a bad idea, but what we found last year when we tried to put too many together at the beginning is the teachers got burned out and, then, and, and they acquired a concept or they were working on something and then they wanted to get back in and put it in practice and sometimes when you have too many days and the other piece is what, what happens when we try to roll out an initiative or work on something you know they want to apply some of it and then they, they need time later to go back and revisit it um, like for the Lucy Hawkins writing you know in the elementary level they're, they're doing some things and then they're implementing and trying and then if we don't have any days periodically through then you can't touch base with them and make sure things are going well so that's why we kind of like try to spread them out somewhat. Well, um, I'm uh, thinking the kids would uh, certainly like having Halloween off, but um, <laughs> well, um, teachers might like it too. I don't know. Well, I mean, I mean it's a staff day. Then we can uh, move to thirty. I mean, I, I, I'm ambivalent on it. I mean, I hear what you're saying, though. I mean, spreading them out has uh, you have a rationale for yeah. it. Um, uh, I like uh, the uh, the second one you gave. I mean, the, the the three half days at the end of the year are generally a waste from an academic perspective. So, so cutting it back down to two, um, uh, and then um, adding that half day on the uh, 23rd uh, when families, many families are traveling, seems to me to be uh, be a great idea. And uh, and you know. I don't know how everybody else feels, uh, but I would, if we're going to post one of these calendars as is, I would want it to be uh, uh, the, the second one, the one you, you uh, just passed out. Um, is the only other issue, um, uh, to, I'm fine with it as it is, but, uh, but if others feel that uh, we should consider sandwiching these two staff days together in 31st and 1st, then I'm fine with that as well. Um, I mean, I was joking about Halloween, but um, that's just timing. I mean, obviously, we're, uh, the first is, uh, is election day, and it's a presidential election year, so, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be a busy day for a lot of people. Um, so it's good that they're, uh, the kids are off, actually, I think, on that day. Um, uh, it's up to you folks. I mean, you know, uh, 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 I do, we don't need a motion right now, right? We just need some direction for the uh, for the administration as to what to. Yeah, it's uh, up to you. I thought you'd want to post it just to let if you had any feedback from the community. But it's I, up to you. I was just going to suggest along those lines, Ms. Fiola. What about um, is this something we could pull the staff saying the thoughts, the concerns, you know, about two days together versus two days apart. Well, that's why I take it to the teachers' union, because she meets with the leadership team of the union, so okay. that's how we get our feedback from the staff. Okay. Uh, and also to, yeah, to post it and then see what feedback we get from parents. I'd like to uh, get their thoughts on the, the whole thing, but also those two days together or two days separate. 
parents won't give us feedback unless we put the two days together because um, they won't know that it's an option um, uh, or unless they watch this and we know we get very high watching of uh, these uh, board meetings um, so uh, why don't we just post this as is and see uh, what the comments are but we'll uh, we'll keep thinking about whether we want to make that change and um, you know would it be possible to go back to to uh, to the uh, to the union and just ask if they would have a preference between those two options? I think we can ask. I just think in the in the feedback that we've gotten before, you know, then that's that's the reason that we sat there and did that. But I, I have no problem going back and asking them. Why not? I just ask one more quick question. When you got the first. September is the, the obviously the staff day, and then you got the 21st, and then you get the first. It's like three in a row, boom, boom, boom. Was there any thought to move them, one of those, to like December, beginning of December, so you had them spread out, so like you could do what you said? Well, yes. Um, well, we can't put, we don't want to put one of the ones at the beginning as somewhere else, because then what you're doing is you're making the student year longer. You see, because that's before students come back. So the 30th, the 31st, and the 1st is all before students come back. So we don't want that in the calendar or it'll lengthen the school year for the kids. But I, I, I know what you said about the other days. And yes. the reason that we have nothing in December is essentially because that's when all of the festivities and things happen. You've got concerts. It's really hard to um, get all of that in in those two weeks or, you know, two and a half, whatever. You, so that's why there's nothing in December. We, I mean, we can certainly move it down a week, but then isn't the first, is that the election? Um, yeah. yeah a, a lot of other districts have that same day as a professional development day, or they're not there, but it's typically a professional development day. Yeah, I know. And then, and then sometimes we have overlapping things, like with for Encore teachers at the IU. or So that's why that one's there. <coughs> We just, we couldn't figure out a better way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I hear what you're saying. Um, and we can move it back the week before in October if you think it would be. Yeah. Mark just looked up for us. Uh, 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 appears that election day this year is not the first, but is the eighth. Oh, it's so always the first Tuesday mm -hmm. after the first Monday. I would recommend switching the first to the eighth. Yeah, well, I think that was the plan. I think it was an error. Um, uh, so um, uh, thank you for catching that. And uh, yeah, you are. You are. Um, and so that solves the problem, I think, uh, because it's the extra week anyway. So. So I'm going to do option B with a little change. Right. Okay. And then our second discussion item is Mr. Hannes here from Dewey Engineering, just to give you a quick update about the renovation project. One thing I wanted to point out, I always have this as my lead slide, and um, these are actual di digital images. They're not photographs of, of the completed work. So. I think everything came out pretty much like we expected. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? Um, moving on to what's been do going on inside the building. Um, <coughs> these rooms, the social study rooms, are, are complete. And uh, Jeff has had his staff stocking. You know, they're occupied now? Moving in. Moving in. Um, the other part is the uh, guidance office. And I'll show you some photos of that. Looking forward, beginning in uh, March 1st, we're going to start working in the purple area. And uh, we had a very good meeting on Monday with all the contractors, and Jeff was there, and Dr. Ziegler was there, on how we're going to isolate this area uh, to prevent it from being a nuisance to your staff. So we had a very good meeting on Monday, and it seems like we got a good plan moving forward. Uh, and then Looking further ahead, the auditorium and the DAO are going to start April 4th after the change order we agreed to. And everybody's been uh, uh, preparing to start that work. And then as the summer comes, we'll be back into this brown area and working on the outside. So 
we're and and in the uh, in the main office. So we're coming to a conclusion. Looking at the uh, finished product in the social studies room, you can see that the case works in, floors done, window shades are up, color on the wall. Uh, here you can see the floors have been waxed. The projectors are up, whiteboards are done. You know they're ready to go. Guidance office. This is the main corridor through the guidance office with the uh, offices on the uh, right hand side. This is the, uh, the the main entrance in there. Will be the reception desk and a nice wall behind it. And, and then going to the outside. Uh, this work wasn't supposed to start till uh, March 1st, but the. Uh, the contractors decided it was probably a good time to get going. They cleared the snow. This is where the turf field's going to go. So they got started on that. Uh, they got one of the infiltration basins in. Uh, you can see it here. Now, infiltration basin is the way we, we manage storm water. The water's going to go into this stone and then infiltrate and recharge the ground. And there are several of them around the, uh, around the turf field. You, you won't notice them once they're done, but they're serving a very, uh, very good purpose. Here you can see they're they're putting one in uh, as of uh, this picture was taken yesterday. This one's pretty much complete. And one thing Ms. Ms. Fiola asked me to do is go over some of the roofing, uh, w the progress of the roofing. We've, uh, we've all been tracking some leaks we had after the 30-inch snow and the heavy rain. We've identified them. Uh, on Saturday, there was quite a, quite a large crew here between roofers. The general contractor was here. The uh, uh, roofing manufacturer was here, as well as one of our staff members going through, uh, identifying the leaks and having them fixed. But, but what I wanted to start with is just give you a kind of an idea of what the roofing system you have. You have what's called a two-ply built-up modified hybrid roof. It has two plies of a built-up sheet that's hot adhered over top of a recovery board and five inches of insulation on your case. And then there's a white cap sheet that goes on top of that. Uh, this roof is a 20-year warranty roof. You get a manufacturer's written 20-year warranty. And to do that, the manufacturer inspects the roof as it's being installed, uh, and they do a final inspection and provide a written warranty. Now, that doesn't mean you get a roof put on and you forget about it for 20 years. You have to maintain it. He's going to come by and do some inspections. So what our job at this phase is to make sure that we keep the roofing manufacturer informed of what we find and we have been, and to try and make sure we don't have any problem areas that are going to be costly for you to do the concurrent maintenance you have to do to maintain the warranty. So I, I didn't have time to get this into your board packet, but I had a little plan. Can you please help me? Just hand them down so you could follow along with what I had. I, we've numbered the leaks. Now, most of these leaks are drips. Uh, and, you know, after 30 inches of snow and, and heavy rains, blowing rains, you know, you're going to get drips, especially on a new roof. It's kind of like sending a ship on its maiden voyage. Now, some of them are more. Some of them have been leaks where we there were damaged tile, in Wally. So if you can follow along, I'm going to take you through one by one what we found, uh, starting with number one. So number one is right here over the engineering lab, and this is what it looks like. Um, it doesn't have the final cap sheet on because there are some units that have to be replaced that service the purple area that we're getting into. So we couldn't put the cap sheet on until we get those units removed and the roof can be filled in, and he's going to put the cap sheet on. What he found here was uh, there's still a lot of traffic on this roof from workers going up there doing what they have to. There were some holes uh, through, the, through the base sheet that they, they uh, patched, and they flood-coated this. And as of today, we haven't had any leaks. Uh, we got a drip in the 400 corridor that we think it's coming from the, one of the rooftop units. Uh, so, and, and that could just be a screw that's... that's missing or something, we'll go up there and, and try and find it. If we can't, we, we usually get a hose up there and hose it down and then we find it. The second one is by the cafeteria and we believe it's right around this column here. 
there was some caulking that could have been put in there and some openings and with 30 inches of snow you can imagine it was probably up to here so uh, that that's been repaired and and as of today and we'll know tomorrow with the rains coming in we'll find it you know if we did but this was just a drip the other thing, we had a couple drips at several of the rooftop units, uh, number three, number eight, number nine on your sheet. And um, it's not unusual when you get a, a driving, blowing snow that some snow can get blown into the intake of the air handling unit and overwhelm the condensate pan in there. So we kind of think that's, these have never leaked before, but during the snow we had a leak. And it was just a drip. So, so it's just something we'll maintain, but. That's what we believe that was. Leak number four, this is a hard picture to see, sorry about that, is along this wall here. This is the cafeteria addition. Um, there's some odd and unique flashing areas there. Uh, and we're trying, we're working with the manufacturer to come up with the best way to flash this. And, and we're gonna have that, God bless you. Thank you. We'll have that when we, we resume roofing uh, at, at the uh, end of school. And then, and then the rest of these, 5, 6, 7, 10, and 14, is in the old roof that, that hasn't been replaced yet. Um, this is what's called a single-ply roof, EPDM single-ply. Uh, if somebody drops a tool on this or walks across it, it'll puncture the roof and you got a leak. And we, the, the, the roofer found many of those and patched them. And the other thing I wanted to point out is this is the science edition, and uh, as you can see, that, that old roof had to get cut out to uh, build the new lab edition. And uh, a lot of this that's on here that you, you know, it's not very well shown on this photo, is temporary patches. So, so it's a lot of temporary patches that, that uh, you know, all in all, they're holding up very well. They didn't hold up to 30 inches of snow, but. This one, this leak was over the music area. Now, th this was a uh, this was a leak that damaged quite a bit of tile in the uh, in that in that music room. And uh, this is an existing clear story that came down, and the new roofing was rolled up underneath that. If you could picture that, and what the manufacturer and the, and the roofer uh, thought, and and I kind of agree with them, is that this snow came down the roof and back, and it was really mound up here and backed up and came in, kind of like a dam. So, so what they did was they put a termination bar here, this silver bar. They put a termination bar there and redid some of the work here. They found a little cut in here that they repatched too. So I, I kind of think that handled it. This is one of the, uh, this is a detail. We have several areas around the, uh, around the building. We have one over the DOA. And we reviewed this before we even began roofing. And I asked that question, and uh, they thought it would be okay without the termination bar, but it seems, you know, they said if it does leak, we'll put the termination bar on, so they did that. And I, and I just want to say that when we discovered these leaks, I mean, you know, we all, we've dealt with some roofing issues for quite a long time, but when we notified the contractor uh, of these issues, uh, they responded quickly, as did the roofing manufacturer. And, and like I said, we had a pretty big crew here on Saturday to, to address these issues. So that's pretty much it. I, I, anybody got any questions? Yeah. Um, concerning the auditorium. Yes. Have uh, have you? Has anyone checked for asbestos yes. in the yes. ceiling? Yes. That was that was that was done by uh, an independent consultant who went through the entire building prior to work and identified areas of asbestos, and uh, that's one of the first activities that'll be done when we get in the, in the auditorium is asbestos abatement. And most of it's on the, uh, the floor tiles. So it's gonna be done while students and staff are in the school? It'll be done in a contained area with negative pressure. It's not unusual that it's done that way. Okay. The, 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 when I say negative air, that, that the air is being sucked out. It's a negative pressure. If you went in there with, uh, with a cigarette, it would be sucked out right away. And, and there's constant air monitoring as they do that. Speaking of air monitoring, there was um, apparently some air quality issues uh, earlier in the week. I don't know if there were air quality issues. Uh, uh, 
they had a hygienist in who, who did some air quality testing? Uh, the district had its third party uh, environmental scientists to come out on a precautionary measures from back in December when we found high fungal spores in the air. So the space that Jim spoke about in the social studies area, before we reoccupied the space, we had the air quality done and everything came out uh, passing. There was no issues with any uh, mold spores, fungal spores, or dust particles in the uh, area where construction and around the area. So we checked in the 100 wing just beyond the containment wall uh, going into the science part of the uh, social studies work. So that's why we waited until we got that information before we started to reoccupy the space. So tonight our staff is moving materials back into the space because we got the green light that we can occupy that uh, area. So the, the issues from Wednesday, is that what you're talking about? No, Wednesday so there morning? No, no issues of air quality uh, in the space at this moment here when we had the testing done. We had the testing done as precautionary because back in early December, there was a smell of mold that we detected when the construction started. So we went, we meaning the construction team <coughs> in the district, uh, went in ahead of time to look at if there was any air quality issues from us disturbing the walls and the floor. We found a high count of fungal, fungi, excuse me, spores, not mold spores. So we did a negative air pressure scrubbing of the air in that area. Got passing uh, results back from the uh, environmental scientists. We followed up just this Friday with uh, a secondary testing because it's now been 60, 70 days or so forth. We wanted to make sure that the work that we did didn't cause any issues or there were no issues in the space. So we passed the results uh, for us to occupy the space there. So some staff had thought that there were air quality issues on Wednesday. So happened we had already had exams scheduled for Friday to take place. And we got our results back uh, late yesterday. Oh, I, I was under the impression that um, a test was done on Thursday, Thursday <coughs> afternoon. There were problems Wednesday morning, and then there was a test on Thursday no, afternoon. So the testing was done, and I could be wrong, it was Thursday or Friday, I forget which day. It was Thursday. It was late Thursday. So that wasn't in, th that wasn't due to the issues, because that was an, an already planned no, test? that was already planned once the project was done to have the environmental scientists who did the preliminary testing to come back to make sure that we uh, conducted ourselves in a, a good manner of, okay. with the air. All right. But it, it just seems like, Jeff, I can add, I know you've been doing uh, testing before we occupy any space. Yeah. It's just a certain procedure that, they, that uh, they've been doing. One more. Have you checked, has, have you checked for lead paint in, in the um, auditorium or anything? I know you found some in the... Um, yes. The, in the cafeteria? The, uh, uh, the, the, the independent consultant has come in and checked for lead paint. And? Well, there's not going to be any welding or, uh, or, or any disturbance of steel structure in the auditorium. So okay. we won't have to worry about that issue. So that won't. I, I'm just, I just don't no, want it to question. set, set us behind. I mean, honestly, I was a little surprised when the lead paint remediation set us behind because, I mean, if a building's built before 1978, there's most likely lead paint in it somewhere. So I was really surprised that someone didn't go, you know what, let's just add that in. There's going to be lead paint found somewhere in this building because of its age. Well, they did, they did do <coughs> lead, lead testing. I, I, that's an independent consultant, that's, and, and he did do that, and uh, he didn't check the, the, uh, the joists on the, uh, on the steel. Because normally you don't find it in the uh, primer on steel. So uh, I'm sorry to belabor this point, but uh, if I just heard you correctly, you're saying that even if there is lead paint in the auditorium, as long as it's not disturbed, we don't do anything about it. That's correct. It's not a hazard unless it's disturbed. Lead paint is not a hazard unless it's disturbed. Okay. Um, and that's not my call. That's the, the consultant. Right. Just real quick a comment. Um, you know, I think we've come a long way from when we first started and we had all these 
you know, back and forth issues. I, yes. I just want to say I think, uh, you know, the comment you made about the uh, contractors jumping on the roof leaks, uh, thank you for mm -hmm. saying that because uh, I, I did drive by and this place has been just a flurry and, and I think we're on the right path. I, I think so. Too. And and and, it, and I'm really appreciate the updates. And I and like you, you made a little comment. I don't know anybody how many caught it, but we're coming to yes. that point, and and it's a good feeling. Yes, it's a good feeling. I was skeptical at first, but uh, I'm very happy with the progress and the direction that everybody's come together. So thank you for well, thank you. everything you've done so far. So I knew in the beginning it was very difficult. It was difficult. It was very difficult. But uh, I, I think we've uh, gotten used to each other. <laughs> yes, that, that's a good way to put it. Thank you. Do, uh, do we have a targeted last day of construction? We do. Uh, it is August 25th. It is August 25th. Does so, uh, that mean you won't see somebody tromping around, touching up some paint, probably, you know, but that, the, I, yeah. For, for the first year of the project, I asked you if we were on time, and for the, from now until the end, I'm going to ask you, are we still on target for August 25th? I, I would think so. I, I think with, with your help and, and uh, your foresight to, to move some of the phasing around, I, I think it's made it a lot easier. It's made it kind of a level flow. It's not a, you know, that kind of flow. I, I feel good about it. I, I think you know you, you need to be commended for that for your he helping to uh, accommodate that. I had one quick question. Uh, I understand because we started the turf field area. Yes. Yes. I understand there's some new legislation that's going to be coming out very soon or within the next year because of obviously hot topic concussions and stuff. An underlay and a certain thickness of underlay has to be placed under the field. Are we prepared for that? Because I don't want to have to not meet qualifications in two years from now. You're asking a question I'm not sure I can answer right now. I will find out for you. Do we and have an underlay, Skane? There's not an underlay. You, you, you have a, uh, a base that goes on there. It, you might call it an underlay. Is it a fabric underlay? No, but the, it's, it's the thickness of the, the turf and the rubber, depending on what the field's used for. If the field's used mainly for football, the turf would be higher and there would be more, uh, more cushion content in it. If it's used for soccer or, or field hockey, it's not going to have as much cushion in it. I would ask the board to consider looking into that. I will get the answer and, and find out for you what, what, what exactly we have. I, I had one other item that I wanted just to um, reiterate to you, and I know you received a memorandum. <coughs> articulating the issue, um, but this has, has to do with the gifted program, and I just wanted to kind of summarize my, my memo because it's been a couple of weeks, but essentially um, you're aware that we had a gifted quality review that was um, a multi-year process in terms of the recommendations that were made, and that review came out right at the time where we were um, changing of the guard for, for the People Services Department in terms of the People Service di Director retiring and the supervisor of special education moving on for another opportunity. So we had a little bit of a lapse in um, being able to implement some of those recommendations with that change in staff. Uh, and then from that, our new pupil services director had picked out certain pieces to be working on. However, in, in along with that, I heard from some of you and some parents about some concerns with the gifted program at the high school. And so I wanted to take some time to investigate that and to kind of look at what was happening there. And I think from my investigation, if you want to call it that, and talking with our, our teachers and um, our, our staff at the high school and, and looking at what, what had happened in terms of our personnel changes at the teacher level, um, we certainly had you know a veteran teacher who had that program running um, quite well. Not that it didn't need some... Um, renovations per the gifted quality review, but it was in a, in a good place. And then when she went out on a medical leave a year and a half ago, and we thought she would be coming back, but did not come back, we have two long-term, um, or a long-term sub in her position, and we had a teacher who had never taught gifted before um, picking up the pieces for the other part of, of the gifted program. 
And in that, I think there was some need for some additional support for, for those persons. And also to really take a look at the programs that are being offered at the high school and see if we can do a better job and do a better, a better job for our students that are there. And so I, I, I'm recommending to you that you consider allowing me to um, contract service with, service with the seasoned personnel um, services administrator to really focus on just a, a special project for a limited amount of time. And that would be to provide immediate support to our um, high school teachers of the gifted and also to work with the high school teachers of the gifted and articulating back through the middle school because we have a cohort of students that are coming up from the middle school um, and we, I wanted to make sure that we were re meeting their needs and I don't think that the current programming that's in place right now at the high school will meet their needs and I'm asking for you to consider allowing us to um, add a course and develop a course for a gifted ninth grade English language arts, um, having looked at what those needs are and spoken uh, specifically with Mrs. Frasca, our gifted teacher at the middle school, and um, develop that course, but at the same time have this contracted service person who's a seasoned administrator work on um, developing that course, but also looking at the independent study opportunities and the previously employed philosophy seminar and seeing what what should be the recommendation in terms of beefing up or enhancing our programming at the high school and then working with those teachers at both the middle school and the high school level to develop what those should look like so that we're doing a better job for our students and then also um, if time permits but also on the docket I'm not sure if it would be this person or continuing with Dr. Roberts <coughs> is getting back into looking at the cohesiveness K through 12 going from the high school back to the middle school to the elementary school. Um, and so the, the recommendation that I asked is for uh, Sylvia Sanfilippo Cohn to come and work with us for um, not to exceed $22,000, it would be $80 an hour for approximately two days a week so that we could address this in a timely manner because I really feel like though it's on our list of things to do and it is part of the gifted program review to do this, it wasn't on the, on the docket for this year, but because of some of these unintended consequences, I really feel like it, um, we're doing a disservice to our students if we don't address it sooner than later and to do it justice, I think we need someone who's just focused on this project. Shelley, uh could you uh, also uh, just, you shared a uh, budget sheet with us uh, on this. Uh, um, I mean, I could, I think I have the numbers in my head, so uh, why don't I just try it and then you can uh, um, correct me if I've got the numbers wrong. Um, this year we had budgeted for the gifted support teacher position in the high school, was it 80 or 90, it was $90,000. Um, and between the long-term sub that just recently left and the new long-term sub that's been hired, our total spend this year will be $50,000. So we're $40,000 um, in the black as it relates to that particular line item on the budget. And therefore, if we approve um, hiring uh, Sylvia, then um, that 22 still keeps us $18,000 below what was budgeted for the year just for the teacher position alone, even though technically she's not a teacher. Um, so, uh, so I just wanted to make uh, that, uh, that clear to the rest of the board. And uh, I have some comments on this, but I wanted to uh, let uh, the rest of you say what you wanted to say. So anybody? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I wasn't here the last couple times. So I've had to look at this on my own and ask others. And um, actually, Rick, with what you just uh, put out there has helped me even more. Um, I think the bottom line here is uh, I think we, with this issue, which is very important, all issues are very important, but this is a, a need quickly that we have to, we have to put forward. I think it's prudent that we take the administration's advice on this and, and, and move forward. Rick, I agree with your assessment on the numbers. It's not going to um, 
to hurt us in any way here, and I think it's a positive step forward to rectify an issue that we have that we need to do. And like I said, I've had a look at this on my own the last <clears throat> week, week and a half, and I've come to the conclusion that I, I think we need to su support this issue right here as it's written. I just had a question. The cohort that's coming up through eighth grade to ninth grade, are they the first cohort that's had this issue with the ELA? Um, I, I, I would say probably not. Um, what, what I found through my investigation of this is that a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we had a, a philosophy seminar class that um, we no longer, we, were, we stopped offering for whatever reason. And the, and the, what I found out was the teacher wasn't certified to teach it, so instead of bringing that to the administrative's attention, somehow it was just dropped from the course guide when we have other teachers that would have been certified to teach it. So I think that that was probably an offering that was robust enough to give them some opportunities, um, but we don't offer that right now. The other piece of this is for our AP course offerings, we only offer, we only, there only are two AP course offerings in English language arts area. And so if, if the student was that far advanced that they were taking an AP course in the ninth grade, which we do have a few that are really ready for that now in, in, in their area of, of interest in English language arts, then we would be, we would be needing to find something for them um, as they approach their junior <coughs> year. So it's, it's kind of like we need to address this now or address this later, but it, um, not only do they have academic needs, but they have social emotional needs. And because of that transition from the eighth grade to the ninth grade, I think it behooves us to kind of keep that cohort intact and, or for the most part are the ones that can and give them those opportunities to work with each other in that cohort. And, and that would also allow the teacher to meet their social emotional needs. I have no qualms with what you're saying there. I'm just trying to figure out why it was not taking care of the years prior, why all of a sudden it's coming up. Because I know a lot of the students that are in the gifted program, we have neglected some of their areas of need and enrichment and such like that. I'm trying to figure out why it's just coming to light now. I, I, like I said, I, the, the teacher that was there, the long-standing teacher, there were never, it, it seemed like things were going well. I, I never had received a complaint at my level that the level of programming wasn't what we had desired it to be. When we did the gifted program review, there were certainly some recommendations in that review that we had on the docket to address. Um, but with the change in the administrative personnel, that wasn't the first thing brought out. Um, Dr. Roberts thought it would be best to address our compliance issues, and she kind of walked in while the teacher was walking out the door, so to speak, in going on her medical leave. So that's where she started, but we just haven't gotten to the point where, um, and then because the teacher was out, it kind of, it declined. It, it you know, kind of <coughs> diminished in terms of the programming that was offered. So I don't, I don't know that we weren't meeting their needs before. It's just, it just, um, I just think that because we had, we lost a veteran teacher that was really focused on the gifted programming, and then you, you know, we had a long-term sub in the position, and then another teacher who's highly energetic and wants to do well by the students, but really had doesn't have the experience and the exposure to the gifted. That kind of all came together, at, you know, and, and made for what we have, which is just need. We just need some support for them and. I think that they're, they're going to do a great job for students. I'm just curious, um, knowing that there was a long-term sub and another teacher in the position who was inexperienced, why wasn't there more oversight? And why is it now sort of an emergency? Now it's, oh, wow, we, ha we have to fix this now. I, I, that confuses me. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people there that should have been you know, watching over these two novice teachers. I don't, I, and I'm saying novice in this area. Where and I, I don't know that I can answer that here, and if you'd like to have an executive session, I'd be more than happy to have, continue that conversation. There's a couple good points made, uh, many good points made. Um, Mr. Rabinowitz, you pointed out about uh, the cost savings uh, in regards to what, what was budgeted to be spent uh, and 
the savings that we'd be in uh, for this line item. Um, but I think there's more to it than that. I also agree with uh, Mr. Rossi that this is an important area. Um, I think, you know, any level of academics we're discussing it certainly is important. This, we have a number of full-time, very educated, very well-paid staff at all levels, including administration, more than some other districts have. That can certainly, and are expected to certainly be uh, providing the support to the gifted teachers. It's not the first time this district would contract with somebody 600, now $640 a day, granted two days a week, up to $22,000. This was not budgeted for. <coughs> this, uh, like Ms. Custer was saying, you know, all of a sudden it's emergency. Um, we have the this, this staff, we have the administrators, we have an administrator whose uh, duty it is very directly to uh, create, provide, supervise a program, uh, Director of People Services. Um, I personally have worked directly for a director of people services and, uh, in a different district and uh, I would struggle to see or to believe that a plate is full or over, over full. This is not a district that uh, has $22,000 laying around. I hear what Mr. Rabinowitz is saying as far as uh, budgeted and, and that person leaving, so now there's those funds. But we raised taxes last year. We're looking at raising taxes potentially 2% this year. Townships, uh, uh, people are facing double digits. The county, they're facing almost double digits. Um, this is one of those examples that I've talked about many times uh, as far as you know, spending and likes and wants and so forth. We have the staff. Let's use them. Let's direct them to do what they need to do and to provide the support and to get this gifted program where it should already be by now. And for some reason it's not, and we need to get it there. Anybody else have anything they'd like to say? I just have one, <clears throat> excuse me, one comment, and that is um, my only concern is that I, I would like to see us not stop at the addition of a gifted language arts class. I don't that's I just I know that that doesn't it's not a perfect fit for every uh, student in that cohort although the the one that is available in the middle school is a great class I've had uh, a child go through that um, but my concern is that if we just uh, pigeonhole it into one area of enrichment that maybe it would be best for some, but not best for all. So my my only concern is that we don't stop there. And I wanted to say, Mr. Alexander, that it wasn't our intent to just stop there. And I hear what you're saying. And I, I also believe that the independent study can be um, enhanced and we, we can bring some good ideas in and also whether or not we should offer a, a philosophy seminar or what else would be out there. And I'm, it's my intent that um, that, that this person would lead and work with the teachers to look at some exemplar, exemplary programs going on around our county and then bring some ideas back because there are students, like you said, that wouldn't want to take a course but do need that support in another way or that enrichment in another way. Originally, I wanted to see this all done in-house because I felt that we, like Bill was saying, um, we had the staff, we have talented, gifted teacher um, in the middle school and we have talented administrators that, you know, and other teachers that could be gifted teachers to all work together. Uh, my understanding is that your point is that there just isn't enough time to get this done. Will this administrator to be hired, uh, temporary administrator, be working with this, I mean, for input, not just to simply say, here's the plan, now you've got to do it, are there going to actually, interaction? Yeah, absolutely, and she is respected by the teachers and the administrators of the district and also worked with Dr. Roberts in the transition because she was here before, during the time before Dr. Roberts came. Um, so I think that it's, it's our intent to have a team, and obviously she's going to lead that, that 
committee, so to speak, and, and we'll bring the ideas together and vet them with our teachers, with our other administrators, and then Dr. Roberts is going to have to pick up where we leave off here, you know, with this small part of this project and then continue the implementation, and that will be her um, focus area for next year, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And the audit that was done a couple, audit that was done a couple years ago, I care not. Um, we spent twelve thousand dollars on that, and came back with a lot of suggestions. Is that going to be sort of used as a roadmap oh, for she's, this? Oh, she's been using it as a roadmap. I don't want you to think she hasn't. It's just that there were some places that she felt she should start. She was concerned about compliance and whether or not we would be, um, you know. I'm talking about for. I apologize for your name. Um, Sylvia. Oh yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're we're, we're going to go right by what what the suggestions were in the in the gifted program review. Absolutely. And and these were areas that we needed to address. It just that wasn't. Let me just add one more point. Um, I would encourage the the uh, my fellow board members to keep in mind. Last week we uh, had a issue come before us, and we one concern was uh, good 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 concern was. Are we going to be setting a precedent? Uh, <clears throat> if we approve this, uh, all of a sudden we need a part-time staff person, uh, despite having more than enough full-time staff, we're going to continue a precedent allowing this administration, this district, to just come up all of a sudden, well, we need to spend another in this case, $22,000. We're going to pay this lady $640 a day. Why not? The spending barrel is bottomless. You want to set the precedent? Vote yes. If you want to take control back, as this board should be doing, vote no. Um, I, uh, I uh, actually don't uh, believe in slippery slope arguments. They're logically fallacious. Um, uh, so uh, just because we approve this doesn't mean that the next thing that comes along um, uh, is going to be approved simply because we approve this based on a precedent, or at least that's my view of it. Um, I understand there's, there's somebody in the audience that'd like to ask a question. I still have some comments that I want to make, but I'll defer them until uh, after the question is asked. Uh, Marisa, did you want to ask something? I do. I have a question. Um, first of all, I think it's important to note that this is definitely not a new issue. I don't, I don't know that problem is the correct word, but it's definitely not a new issue. Um, so I have a junior who three years ago took um, a, an advanced ELA course in the eighth grade, um, setting the tone for him to really need to come into an advanced ELA class in the ninth grade that was not available. Um, so honors ELA was the option, and which, is, which is what he took. Um, I currently have a freshman who did the exact same thing, took the remarkable advanced ELA course in the eighth grade and then transferred into honors English, um, which just truly does not meet the needs of the children who really excel in the eighth grade ELA. So it is a definite need. Um, we are two parents here of, of students in the gifted program, and so I, my question, Shelley, is for you. I just want to be clear, um, because maybe we both <coughs> missed something, but is this temporary hiring just addressing the needs of the eighth grade cohort, or are we looking at the gifted program altogether? Um, because I know that there are some needs that would, that would need to be met of our current high school students, programming not available at the high school level. Well, when I articulated this to the board, I, I said a couple things. One, that we want to provide immediate support for the, and professional development to assist the teachers that are currently in the high school. So we have a long-term sub and we have another veteran teacher that just has, needs that support. My, Michael already started working with the teacher, having had some experience himself over the professional development days. But I need someone that can be there, boots on the ground, working with the teachers that has the time to commit to that. Because I do agree with you that, that we have teachers, or students rather, currently in the high school that we want to give better support to, more support to. The teachers are eager to do that. We just need to get them some support. So that's one thing. One, I wanted to implement a gifted English language arts honors weighted course to address some of the needs, like you said, when the students come from the eighth grade to the ninth grade, but not only does it address their academic needs, but it's also a way to address their social emotional needs. And then also to research designs and models for gifted programming um, and utilize the resources um, to support the gifted learning. So look outside the box, outside of Pottsgrove, 
What are other schools um, doing that have good gifted program, exemplary program? What does that look like? Now, thinking to the future, what would we like to see in the Pottsgrove School District? And then let's start the planning for that so that we can um, beef up and, and, and enhance what we're already doing. Those are really the three key things. And then also, if time, start looking at the scope and sequence from the high school to the middle school to the elementary school, because I think there needs to be some better articulation there. And we also have a new teacher at the elementary level um, who's trying to learn and, and become better at what they're doing. And I think bringing those teachers together on a more regular basis and, and sharing of those ideas and looking at the cohesiveness across the program. Shelley, um, I just want to clarify what you just said and in relation to uh, Marisa's question um, because, um, well, let me just start with a comment. And the comment is if we were just adding a gifted ELA course, if that was the only thing we were doing, I would not be in support of, of, the, of this particular spend because I think that we would have the staff to be able to handle that if that was the only thing that needed to be done. And um, I'm willing to bet you would probably agree with me if that was the only thing to be done. So, um, uh, you know, and I do remember you saying to me at some point um, during our discussions about this that, uh, you know, that we have an immediate need beyond the incoming eighth graders uh, uh, with the gifted programming in the high school and that Sylvie is going to be focusing on addressing those immediate needs. You mentioned a couple of other things, but in general, the programming for the existing gifted students in the high school. I just want to clarify that yes. that is a major point. Uh, yes, and the teachers are very excited to work with someone that will help lead them. They really are. They want, they want to do a great job, and I know they will. I'm confident. So uh, I didn't want to cut you off. Did you uh, have anything else? Um, so I, um, in case you can't tell from um, my uh, some of the comments I've made, I am in favor of uh, of uh, this particular uh, spend, um, and um, and I will add that uh, the gifted program, uh, when I uh, became board president, uh, and even during the election time, was one of uh, three areas that I personally considered uh, very important to make. Uh, changes to and uh, and and address uh, this particular issue, but not only this particular issue. So for me, um, I'm actually quite thrilled that we're uh, moving forward with uh, with some of these ideas and that we're going to give it the attention that it deserves. Um, and I, before we uh, end the discussion on this, um, I, I just wanted to, uh, um, don't worry, I have a couple of pages here, but I'm not reading a couple of pages to you. Um, uh, but um, I did do a little research, um, as I like to do, on gifted programming. Um, and, you know, the part that uh, concerns me most about what we're doing um, uh, is the if time allows part, um, uh, because time never allows. Um, uh, so when time doesn't allow, um, uh, we're still not going to address some of the uh, issues that I've raised previously uh, in relation to, uh, to state guidelines uh, for gifted programming and, uh, and the road we've been traveling down across the board with our gifted programming in relation to those guidelines, which it's hard to summarize in a single sentence, but the way I would summarize it is uh, a fo uh, aligning gifted programming with with uh, standards, uh, but specifically standards uh, that uh, that students are tested on, um, which uh, and 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 in my opinion, uh, there's a movement in the state to turn gifted pro gifted services and programming into sort of a super test prep program, and I couldn't more vehemently disagree with that. Um, there, there's nothing in the code that has changed. It's just these guidelines that some people uh, that work for the state or in some cases liaise with the state have put out and are teaching um, to teachers across the state in training classes. Um, and I've become very familiar with it. I am, uh, it's all out there for people who are crazy enough to want to spend hours going through the material. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say uh, uh, is a little snippet here from uh, Gifted Education Press Quarterly where 
Um, it says, the standards do not define the nature of advanced work for students who meet the standards prior to the end of high school. For those students, advanced work in such areas as literature, composition, language, and journalism should be available. The standards set grade-specific standards but do not define the intervention methods or materials necessary to support students who are well below or well above grade level expectations. Um, uh, it is beyond the scope of the standards to define the full range of supports appropriate for English language learners and students with special needs. So that's the first point I wanted to make. In other words, the standards um, uh, really are a minimum for, um, for uh, our students to achieve. Um, but gifted learning isn't about um, uh, complying with minimums. And some schools in our area are effectively converting um, gifted education to meeting minimums. And I could not disagree more with that. And I urge the administration, as they go through this, to, to look at what we're doing and, uh, and adjust. Um, and um, I'm going to skip this other thing. But I have, I'm going to send this to you, Shelley. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, from the National Surveys of Gifted Programs, Executive Summary 2014. And it has a great um, uh, summary. Uh, page implications of uh, of, like of what we're it. talking about. So uh, I would appreciate if you would take a look at it. Um, and uh, and along those lines, then uh, last, uh, I think it's very important that the board um, has representation um, in this committee that you're talking about. Um, and uh, um, uh, I have a volunteer from the board who is willing to make himself available to go along with site visits um, uh, to, uh, to other schools um, uh, and participate to the fullest extent possible without getting in the way of the work of, uh, of the committee. And I thought about trying to make a motion um, uh, to, to make that happen, but I would, uh, would rather just say, let's, let's, just, let's just agree that Jim uh, uh, Lapick is going to be that representative, assuming you still are willing to do so. Well, I think anybody should be allowed to, but you volunteered to, um, uh, and, you ha and you have a lot of knowledge of gifted education. So I think it would be great. Um, uh, I, I want the board to be status on this and not be surprised at the end of the game. So um, that's my personal goal with this. Um, and, uh, and the end of the game may not be when Sylvia leaves, based on what you're telling me. So um, uh, you know, it's very important to me. So that's all I have to say on this. Uh, does anybody else um, have anything else they want to say? I have one more comment. Um, I'm going to vote absolutely in support of this. Uh, I know that our program, I know many of the students, of course, that are in the gifted program, and I, I've known for years that it's been lacking, so I'm kind of surprised to hear that it's just coming up now. Uh, but my issue and concern is going to go back. I'm hoping to hear for some assurances of accountability that we've had this issue, and time being an issue, where we had to go outside to do a review, we paid $12,000. We didn't have the manpower to do that. Now we're at the point where, again, we have to ask for help from an, another outside person because we don't have the time. And my concern is, after this is all done, of not being in the same boat a year from now and saying, OK, we don't have the time to complete all of the necessary procedures or necessary programs or whatever. I just want to hear from the administration that we definitely are going to be accountable to make sure to whomever is accountable to make sure that this program works. We're not going to need a year or two years from now another person. We're going to get this program on track and in the budget that we have right now after this is taken care of. I think, uh, Mr. Leach, I can tell you that the things that we are recommending, you know, you know we're, we're going to be able to follow through and get those things done. I said this all along to Mr. Rabinowitz and everybody else that we're not going to fulfill everything in the gifted quality program review in this short project. We're going to fulfill the things that we said that we were going to fulfill in the memorandum that I, I outlined and went over this evening. And then Dr. Roberts is going to have to carry this through. And, you know, we are a small district. We are, as much as you might think we're over administratively staffed, if you did a, a little bit of research and looked around at some of the other neighboring districts, we really are short staffed in terms of our administration and what we have to accomplish. So from time to time, we have had additional assistance with projects. This would be a project, in my opinion. 
but it's certainly a, a cost save for the district to have a project here and there as opposed to having another administrator. And when we had the, um, the downturn in the economy, we forfeited an administrator at that point, which I really think it was a loss to the district in terms of being able to support curriculum and instruction. And uh, it, it really, really made our um, district office support very thin. And, you know, one of the things that has come up in this short time that we've had two new administrators in the People Services Department is, you know, the needs for special education in and of itself, beyond, not, not including pupil services, special education is beyond one person. When you're talking about over 650 students who have IEPs, currently uh, Mrs. Pasito is the one person that is overseeing all of those IEPs and it's and what we're finding is it's too much. So we could come to you and we say we need to add another supervisor of special education, but we're not doing that. What we're doing is I'm now giving that Mara Roberts is picking up one of the buildings for IEPs to lessen the load for Mrs. Pasita, which we didn't even go over tonight, of how overtaxed that is and how we have to be careful to dot our I's and cross our T's and to make sure that our students were meeting our students' needs. So she's picking that up and then we're giving this special project to someone else because at this point we have we have a lot of needs and, and we have a lot of balls in the air and we don't always have the, the enough administrative support to to handle all of those things but yes I am committing to the things that we that we said we would do I have researched it I've lived it <clears throat> and I respectfully disagree bottom line is just from what we're hearing here uh, just looking at the facts as they're being presented we have people in their full-time roles with the job descriptions of things that should be done and you're saying weren't done the ball was dropped and now we're being asked we're asking the community chuck up chuck up 22,000 bucks to get this thing fixed I will be voting no. let me be very very clear that my no vote is in no way uh, representative of a lack of uh, commitment to the gifted program in no way is that the case. Uh, I fully support the gifted program in every other academic and non-academic program in this district, but I will be voting now. Let's move on. To uh, action items. I recommend that you approve the professional staff items as submitted. So moved. Motion and a second. Are there any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 9-0. I recommend that you approve the support staff items as submitted. Second. Who made the motion? Got a motion and a second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 9-0. I recommend that you approve the supplemental special payments as submitted. So, second. Motion and a second. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nine, nothing. I recommend that you authorize the administration to approve the independent contractor agreement with Dr. San Sylvia Sanfilippo Cohn for special education gifted services as presented. So moved. I have a motion and a second. We've uh, just uh, had a long discussion about this. Uh, uh, does anybody else have any other comments? Um, uh, Shelly, oh, is um, she available right away? To I, I would say I would think uh, by next Monday we can probably get started. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed? No. Motion, motion carries 7-2. I recommend that you approve the Montgomery County um, Intermediate Unit Membership Budget as presented. So moved. I have a motion and a second. Um, I have a question. Um, uh, it's really, I know the answer, but for the public. Uh, the budget, uh, has it changed from last year? No. Zero increase. So we have a zero increase uh, in the uh, MCIU provides countless services to uh, this school district and is uh, very well run. Uh, and 
uh, being a former board member um, uh, on the MCIU, I'm a big proponent of, uh, of what they do, not just for us, but for the county and <coughs> for special needs students, uh, uh, pre-K, and um, it's really a great organization in my opinion. So uh, that said, are there any other questions or comments? I have to do a tally vote to take with me, I think, to the MCIU tomorrow. Or else I give it to Lori, I'm not sure. But I have to do a tally vote per member for yes or no. Okay. You want to pass? So, um, uh, you know, if we were, if, if um, hopefully we're 9 0 and that makes yeah. the tally easy. But uh, um, so. Uh, tally vote, they could just call it out, right? They could. Did you? Is there anybody going to vote no on this? <laughs> We're all going to vote yes for this. Uh, I'm going to vote yes, but I do have a question okay. in regards to this. Uh, I agree with everything you just uh, shared, Mr. Rubinowitz, but um, looking over this, not contract, but uh, membership uh, budget, in regards to the Office of Technology Services, are we using this to the max? Um, I ask that because we quite often hear uh, about expenditures in this district in regards to technology, and I'm uh, certainly not anti-technology, but I want to make sure we're, we're using what we're already paying for as well. For example, just a month or two or three ago, uh, we or last week maybe, we talked about, and uh, <laughs> it all runs together, uh, the E-rate, uh, an issue with E-rate, I see the IU does that, uh, consortium grant writing, purchasing of hardware and soft software, are we using this part of the IU to the max. Michael should speak to that because... We are uh, actually one of the most, uh, most engaged districts in the county with the um, Office of Technology Services at the intermediate unit. Um, I can say that we're with a great deal of confidence. We are part of the agenda planning team. Um, we're, we're very active. We use all the services that are that are appropriate for us and for our needs, and we usually go to the IU first. Um, we're a part of the IU Internet Consortium, so specifically to the E-rate, we're already taking advantage of their free E-rate services, which um, which we are which we participate in as a, a district. Uh, member of the Internet Consortium. So that covers our broadband Internet uh, services, but telephones and other eligible services, that's what we discussed um, a couple of, uh, it was probably back in January, uh, December, I think, when we asked for the, uh, to add um, the intermediate unit as our E-rate consultant. That's for the additional services are not included under what was listed there. We have a motion and a second. Are uh, there any other? There, we already have questions asked. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries nine there zero. Makes your tally easy. I recommend that you authorize the administration to enter into an agreement with CCIU Child Development Center as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, I'm very, very familiar with, uh, oh, is this CDC? Yeah, CDC. Uh, and they have an excellent program and a uh, broad range of programs there. I'm presuming you're talking about the CDC at the, with the CCIU. Mm -hmm. uh, but the distance, does Montgomery County not have anything that would meet the students' needs so far away to drive to cultural each day? I, I really can't discuss that here, but I, I mean it's an IEP decision. <coughs> It's not my decision to make. It's an IEP team decision. And it, again, we're being asked to vote on something, though. So I, I do hear what you're saying. It's an IEP decision uh, that we are the LEA at, that we have an LEA at, and where that we do approve uh, ultimately placements. And while, like I said, CDC is an excellent program. It's uh, hard for me to imagine not knowing the situation, nor should I know the situation, 
uh, that Montgomery, there's nothing closer for this child, a Montgomery County resident? I, I think that you, it, there might be something closer, but what happens is you have to negotiate with the parent and the special ed department, and they work together, and this was the placement that was selected that would meet the student's needs that was um, open to both parties, and that's how, that's how placements get decided. So I, I can't, I mean, if you could not approve it, and then we could be in uh, litigation over it. I don't think that would be what you'd want to do. All right. Um, uh, let's, uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 9-0. I recommend that you approve the payment of invoices listed above. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 9 0. I recommend that you approve the conference attendance as presented. I have a quick question about B. B? Yeah, B. Uh, we're sending some, we're going to pay someone 300, I mean, I'm, again, I, I know it's only $398 and such, but still, to an embroidery machine training? Yeah. It seems kind of odd. Well, I mean, we can't provide that kind of training to our, our, our family and consumer science teachers, so if they find something outside that is in line with what they're doing and trying to accomplish, we want to support their professional development. Yeah, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, this brings up a topic that... Uh, I've just been waiting for opportunity to, to bring up, but I think we need to be reviewing uh, the courses that are being offered and provided at the middle school and high school. Uh, this is one of the courses that I have strong concern about, that we're, uh, where I, I can't help but to wonder if that time wouldn't be used more valuable. Uh, I'm very impressed with the fancy wancy sewing machines that are in there. I was in there one day. Uh, quite impressive, but uh, I don't believe a single student will make use of that after sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Uh, and and I, I'm not going to, I think we should vote against this, and I think we need to look at this more closer if we want to be spending the money on this type of, um, I think we need to discuss it at a later time. Um, I actually uh, just have a question. Um, is FACTS a requirement? For us to uh, offer to students, I know when I was no, in. No, I mean off the top of my head, I'd have to look. But Chapter Four doesn't specifically articulate family and consumer science. I, I know phys, phys ed's a requirement in health, but the other offerings for Encore, um, you know, we there, we have discretion there. So I mean, yeah, we don't have to offer. Um, you know, um, I'm not going to lie. I'm not a big facts fan personally, but um, but I'm not well, willing to. Uh, to, without more research, state whether it's uh, worthwhile or not. Um, I think it's worthwhile. Uh, I'm sure it is worthwhile to a lot of students. But if we're going to, uh, um, to consider it, um, it should be done properly as part of the curriculum committee process. And, uh, um, you know, for the time being, um, uh, and for a long time in the past, we've offered this course, and we have a teacher who uh, uh, is uh, seeking professional development. So, uh, uh, Bill, if you want, we can pull B out so you can vote no for it. Um, let's, let's pull all three out if we can. Do, just do, I mean, vote for them separately is what I'm saying. Sure, why not? I have a, I just have a quick comment too that I, I respectfully disagree with you, Mr. Parker, that um, you have to provide learning opportunities for all students. You don't know you have no crystal ball to look into and say not one person would benefit from using that. There could be some people that latch onto that and think, wow, this is the greatest thing ever, and could take using something like that into adulthood and into their retirement years. So I'm all for it. Please let the public comment just very quickly. Sure. The technology fair that you provided at, at the high school, gosh, maybe two years ago, Mr. Wagman, Gloria Fritz was there with this embroidery machine, and I want to tell you something. It was un believable it was unbelievable it, it truly was I mean th there was a line lined up of people watching what she was doing and um, personal opinions are certainly very well respected but FACS is a very worthwhile course they're teaching very worthwhile skills so perhaps it's not gifted 
education, which gets a lot of focus, but it is absolutely a very worthwhile service we're providing to our students. That, that course has a lot of merit, and there are a lot of students who benefit greatly from what's learned in there. And I'd like to just piggyback off that because it's, it's shameful for us to say that we really don't care about this this uh, this 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 class. Um, you know, we, we're about all the students. So um, I, I'm I'm really saddened to hear that comment being made about our students. Uh, I don't Patty, think I'm, I, no, I don't, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna respond, please, because I made the comment. I feel like I'm uh, you know Trump and uh, you're Trump. I'm somebody else. I, I, and I got 30 seconds here. Thank you, moderator. Um, let, let let me be very. I, I fully support FACS. I think they do a great job in there. I had the opportunity to sub in there. Uh, I love the cooking, for example. I think the kids are going to make use of that. Uh, that's the only part I saw, but I know they do other things. Talking about budgeting, I think, is very important. That would, seems to me, would fall under that. I don't agree with, and, and again, it's not for now, but I don't agree with uh, that sewing. There's a lot of things we could be doing. We could have an auto shop and, and uh, having all the kids experiencing that, because you never know, bless you. What, what somebody's going to latch on to. Uh, but we need to decide as a board at the appropriate time uh, what we're going to offer and what we're not going to offer. We can't offer every possibility. Uh, but uh, let me be clear, FACS as a whole, there's a lot of positives to that program. I don't agree with, with the sewing piece. So don't, uh, don't put words in my saying in my mouth saying all uh, right. we don't care about okay. this. Okay. Um, now look, um, uh, I just want to clarify what I said, and then let's just move on. We're talking about a training class for a teacher here. Um, Correct. I um, uh, uh, sh probably shouldn't have made my uh, my personal feelings about uh, about um, uh, this course uh, known, but I also made it clear that uh, I would never uh, support removing a class. Um, that had value to the uh, students. Um, and uh, somebody suggested that maybe we should look at it, and if they want to look at it, that's fine, but, um, but not without uh, all due consideration to the value, um, and as well as the, the alternative, which is something else that might be more valuable or might be less valuable. So um, you want to, uh, uh, we need to pull these out, so uh, um, we had, have we even got a motion yet? No, okay. Mr. President, can I say one more thing? Please. Please, thank you. Um, for us to sit here and say, well, and Bill, I'm going to just use what you said, and I'm not going to, I'm going to say it exactly the way you said it, to sit here and say, well, we could pull the sewing out and do auto shop. Well, what makes one more, more important than the other? I have two daughters, both of them went through FCA, FACS, and especially my youngest daughter who now lives with me. I'm a single dad. She latched onto that. It gave her something to believe in and something to strive for. Uh, I think everything from sewing to 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 this machine to th this teacher wants to go and learn something to bring here and pass on to to and and, and further her course. Uh, who are we to say that um, we we uh, should deny this teacher a, a learning process? She's still learning too, the teacher, and to have her go learn to teach our students something. I think both male and female, because there are both male and females who take this course, um, is invaluable. Uh, I mean, we got a lot of broken families in this district, and a lot of these kids don't have the opportunity to be taught by anybody how to do these simple things, sewing, cooking, checkbook, uh, making a bed, whatever it is. And I think it's very, very, I, I think out of all the things we do, it's one of the most valuable things that we can teach these kids. It's how to move on in life and how to get through life. So we can pull them out, but, and we can vote on them. Let's vote on them. Let's, That's everybody. great. Let's vote on them. Um, uh, let's vote on uh, A, please. Uh, do we have a motion? Yes. Motion. Do we have a second? Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 9-0. Uh, uh, motion for B? Motion. Motion and second. Uh, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Aye. Motion carries 7-2. And then C? Do we have a motion? So moved. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries 8-1. And committee reports. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I messed up. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was hoping we were going to come in. <laughs> Authorize the administration to develop an additional course offering um, English language arts gifted as presented. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Any questions or comments? Uh, my suggestion is that we wait until Sylvia comes in and reviews the um, the whole gifted program and then decide. And if she recommends it, then we go with it. Well, I mean, I, I mean you can do what you want, but I, as I explained before, I mean, I personally met with the teachers and we looked at the students' needs and I believe there's an identified need for those students coming up and therefore, that was my recommendation to proceed with this. And sh she will work with them to um, you know, develop it and figure out well, what, how does that look differently from an honors ninth grade course and how are we meeting their needs. That, that's what she's going to do. But I want the authority to do it because the course booklet has already been published and presented. And we have meetings coming up with our gifted parents. And if the board should approve this, then the building principal, um, Dr. Ziegler, and our teacher at the middle school, Deb Frasca, will meet with the parents. And then for those who they deem appropriate, they'll make this recommendation. And then we can do a hand schedule change and place them in that course, which is why I have it here for you to discuss now. Okay. Wait, the time is of the essence for this piece. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I'll be voting yes in that case. Well, um, Let's uh, move on to uh, committee reports until uh, the members of the board that are coming back uh, come back, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, move forward with this one. Please, do, can we do that? Okay. Fine by me. Okay. Um, tonight at six thirty, uh, the policy policy committee met, and uh, just to. <clears throat> synopsis of what we reviewed um, three policies that were uh, under review for the the past uh, month or two uh, we we went over again uh, the first policy was 005 uh, for the organization um, this is where we established our committees uh, and we've been through this uh, this policy uh, for the last two meetings. This time around, we just had some very minor uh, wording, and I, I didn't I didn't uh, write down the exact wording because they'll be posted now for for public review. Um, but we had some just very minor wording changes. There were no changes to the intent of the policy, uh, grammar corrections, and things like that. So we're we, we made a few additional red lines and we'll be able to post that for public review shortly. Um, policy 217, uh, which is the requirement, the graduation requirements, uh, we reviewed again uh, what, what we want to do around the requirement uh, to use the Keystone exam uh, results as a graduation requirement. So. If I, if I don't explain this exactly right, jump right in, please, uh, Shelly and Bill. But as of right now, the state's put a, a moratorium on requiring uh, passing of the Keystone exams for high school graduation. Uh, the question is, does Pottsgrove wish to require the Keystones as, as a part of the graduation requirements as they have in the past? Um, if we follow the state moratorium, there's a concern that uh, the tests won't be taken as seriously. If the test scores go down, uh, 
we could it could affect our uh, school performance profile and things like that um, we also I guess really we need to research and be more clear on whether the state requires at all that, that, that students take the test so if they don't even require that the students take the test it would, it would make it especially difficult for us to call it a graduation requirement um, so the committee agreed we need to do some more research uh, before we decide whether we're going to stay with having the keystones as a graduation requirement um, we'll discuss this again at the next policy meeting uh, and we'll keep the community abreast of our discussions and, and what we find out and then again as as this policy becomes finalized we'll post it for public comment um, third policy number 249 uh, the bullying and cyberbullying policy so last last month in discussions about this policy the committee had concerns that the, the state set some very specific criteria for what constitutes bullying um, we have a requirement as a district to report back to the state how many incidents of bullying uh, occur in each school uh, so our concern was that if a if an incident if a, if a particular incident didn't meet the specific definition of bullying um, which states that it has to happen repeatedly over a period of time uh, and a lot of other specific criteria would we be quick to dismiss an issue because it didn't meet those criteria of being bully bullied the district does have policy on harassment that we believe covers those one-off situations which tend to occur just as much if not more as bullying the concern was the semantics of the word bullying there's a stigma around the word and if something happens one time a parent or a student will tend to believe they've been bullied and go down the wrong route as far as how to address it so we've added some language to the policy to uh, to cover that in saying that one-off incidents uh, instances um, will be addressed uh, and we I believe we want to put a reference to the harassment policy into the bullying policy so because a parent is going to go directly to the bullying policy if they feel like there's their child's been bullied so we want to make sure that we're pointing them in the right direction if they don't find what they need when they go to this policy that they know there's another route um, so again that's just clarifying uh, to make sure that these policies aren't just there for the sake of being there but that they're useful for the people who go to them as a reference there was a lot of conversation about those three policies and we ran out of time we had some new things to discuss that didn't make it but we'll make it to the next meeting uh, and those are uh, the policy for board representation specifically based on recommendations at the last board meeting uh, to consider introducing a second uh, student board rep that would be a junior I believe and and uh, have them kind of spend a year prepping to be the actual uh, senior student board rep so that they can be more effective um, that's based on other districts and the way they do it uh, and so we're going to look at changing our policy to uh, to implement that and then the second was the changes in the uh, volunteering procedures that happened in 2015 so we want to make sure that we're compliant with state requirements there so those will be covered at the next meeting even though they were on the docket for this one we didn't get to them and I just want to add um, uh, if you don't mind Matt um, uh, in relation to the uh, the phys ed requirement um, uh, I actually uh, read from a conversation uh, that I had with a uh, parent via instant message today um, leaving out the names um, but the information that uh, was shared um, the parent had expressed some legitimate concern about um, how uh, difficult it is to schedule phys ed uh, in uh, a robust schedule with a lot of AP classes in science labs and um, one of the things that uh, that we've been assured is that uh, that the new uh, um, independent study class uh, 
or independent dependence, but do you call it a class? Independent study uh, is designed uh, largely for this situation so that a student who can't um, squeeze it in otherwise is still getting the appropriate physical education um, but not um, being forced to drop uh, uh, you know, uh, an important academic class. So while the requirement is going to stay uh, at um, uh, with that 0.49 or be increased to match the practice, however you want to look at it, um, we're offering this alternative now. Um, and hopefully that meets everybody's needs uh, as it relates to phys ed. So, but we still haven't passed it. It's still, um, yeah, it still needs uh, further uh, work. And now moving back uh, to the uh, to the action item that we did not vote on. We did have a motion and a second on the uh, additional course offering for ELA. So uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 9-0. New business. I do have some new business. Um, I was actually honored to attend um, the Dr. Ken Ginsberg um, seminar, which was awesome here. Um, and if any parent gets a chance, Google it and look up Lighthouse Parenting. It's absolutely amazing. Um, this guy spoke for over two hours, um, and he spoke on uh, building resilience in children. And um, he was just right on in today's society. So I encourage everybody to look that up. Um, it's a good read. And I also like to thank the Pottstown Health and Wellness uh, Foundation for sponsoring um, these, this educational event. And then what they did with the grant that they received, they actually bought enough of two books that they gave all the audience. So I, I've got a good reads too. So if anybody wants to be next, I'll hand my books over. But um, definitely look him up because it, um, it really enlightened me, um, my thought process as a grandmother now. <laughs> but um, Dr. Ken Ginsberg, look, a good read. Rick, I have, I have one thing if it's OK. Um, I just wanted to kind of communicate uh, something that's going on over the Western Center to the, to the rest of the board here. Um, on Thursday, I'm making a trip with the center director, Chris Moritzen, up to the uh, Middle Bucks Technical Institute to observe their sports medicine program. So it's been recommended and it's uh, under development at the Western Center to put together a program in sports medicine. Um, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's been a few courses over the last few years that have just the the, the enrollments fallen off and uh, just the outlook as far as those careers um, has started to dim um, so the the Western Center is constantly looking for uh, what they can do to, to better serve the students of today in trying to prepare them uh, for a, a fruitful career uh, in a technical field and and really I mean if you look at the numbers uh, the percentage of kids that they send into uh, two and four year colleges is is very high based on the the education that they receive over there and this this sports medicine program uh, is something that's really exciting to the to the JOC over at the Western Center so far they've looked at their partnering with the Rothman Institute uh, the YMCA and and more to come so they're making some trips I know Chris was out at Penn State today I believe observing their uh, program and then Thursday out at the Middle Bucks Technical Institute. Um, and, and I'm sure that uh, the three of us will have more to report as things go on. I just wanted to let everybody know that that's something that's very exciting going on over there. Uh, they're looking at remodeling an area uh, to set up for this program and, and make it just fl a flagship program. It's, it's very forward thinking. There's not a lot of these programs in the state right now. Um, I think this will be the third, or maybe there's three and this will be the fourth. Uh, there needs to be ten total in order for the state to actually uh, put their stamp on a set curriculum for a course like this. So the, the Western Center here 
if we move forward, and I think we will, will be one of those uh, one of those centers that's actually paving paving the uh, the way for for uh, future programs. So it's it's something very interesting uh, that's going on over there. Yeah, um, I wanted to um, bring up some issues that have been brought to my attention concerning the um, standard-based grading that was passed, uh, I believe it was last June, by the board. Um, I'm hearing from kids, parents, teachers, that um, there's nothing standard about it right now, and um, quite a few of the kids that I have spoken to um, are very unhappy with the 90-10 split. Uh, I personally feel that um, it's sending the wrong message because kids are not doing their homework because it only counts for 10%. So they can not turn in one piece of homework the entire year and still get a 90 in their class if they're good test takers, if they understand the, the, uh, um, the curriculum, uh, and they can still get an A, and they haven't done any homework. Um, there's instances where large packets are being sent home and worked on, and uh, only to find out that it's only worth 10%. And so, you know, two, three hours goes into doing something and it doesn't change their grade at all. Um, there's this whole test retaking. Um, kids aren't studying for their tests because they know they can just retake it. So why study, of, study for it for the first time around? Um, I would really like to look into this as a board and um, just do some more research and find out if this is actually the way that uh, we need to move forward or if we need to uh, revisit and revise because um, as of right now I'm not seeing success with it um, and I would love to get input from others also and I have uh, one other last item I'd like to bring uh, some attention to uh, for the administration to possibly look at and possibly become a discussion item in the future as well. Uh, we have something that's new this year with the high school called the Pride Period. I could tell you you guys need to look at what's going on with the Pride Period for the parents that are have students in the high school and the student itself. The Pride Period is nothing more than a let's get together and either do homework, let's just joke around. It is absolutely not following its intent. Uh, the teachers themselves are just saying, just sign in here, then you can go wherever you want. I don't, I don't care. Uh, that's just unacceptable in my idea. Uh, the idea was a good idea on what it was going to do, but it's not, the implementation is absolutely faulty at this point. Well, Mr. Leach, just to respond to that, um, that is one of the strategies that's in the high school school improvement plan, the, the school innovation plan. So our cycle is coming up to be reviewed now in March. So that's certainly going to be a topic for conversation with Dr. Ziegler about what they are finding and then, you know, with your input that you just provided, I can probe further and, you know, provide the feedback that you're seeing and we can um, <coughs> assess what's happening and why if, you know, if things aren't being implemented as they had designed and what we need to do differently. So I will be following up with him when we, we had that. And it's, it's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Okay. And, uh, you know, um, regarding uh, your uh, comments, Ashley, uh, um, I also have a lot of concerns about the way things appear to be going with, uh, with grading this year, although it's, uh, it is year one of a two-year plan. And, um, uh, I would just say that uh, that I agree that uh, we really need to have uh, a lot more conversation about it. Uh, no matter what you do I, with grading, I think somebody's going to be unhappy. But but at the same time, um, I too am hearing from a lot of parents 
about this. And and you know what, uh, anybody with a middle schooler or a high schooler um, yeah, on this board or um, or in the audience uh, is is also personally experiencing some uh, issues. Uh, and I would definitely concur that I'm seeing it myself in addition to uh, to what we're hearing from parents. So I don't know, um, you know, uh, if the uh, the curriculum meeting next week is uh, is the time to talk about it. We already have some portion of grading on the agenda, but I also fear it could pretty much fill up the entire agenda in uh, in very short order. Um, so I just want to concur that uh, this is something that really does need to get some attention um, because uh, the year is finishing quickly, and if we need to make adjustments, then time is running out. So. And I would like to encourage any parents that do have this issue and have any questions about it to, to follow the command. You know, go to the teacher, go to the principal, you know, follow the protocol, um, that, you know, to just get the word out, you know, because if, if they don't know it, they can't fix it and help it before it comes to us. Try to go through the chains. Hold on. Just add a comment. That's a very good, just to uh, go off of what Ms. Grimm was saying, it's a very good point. Anything that any of us hears, hopefully, has uh, certainly uh, the teachers and principals uh, are aware of. You know, maybe you're making us aware, but as long as they also shared it with the principals, you know, and and they could know what's happening in their buildings and addressing these concerns. Well, in some of the cases, uh, um, uh, the te the teachers at least have. Uh, been uh, consulted and and I've passed some of that information on to uh, Mrs. Viola. So I'll just say that um, uh, I think the issue is larger than chain of command here. Any other new business? Adjourned.